Duana Precup is our next speaker. She's a computer science professor at the university in uh, McGill University in Montreal and also directs DeepMind Montreal. She's an expert in reinforcement learning, and I think what she'll share with us today is how there are analogies and similarities between hierarchical reinforcement learning and some of the models for, for human and animal decision making. So, Duina, thanks for joining us. Please welcome her to Stanford. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, I'm going to uh, basically follow up from uh, what uh, Bill mentioned earlier. Uh, which is uh, the, this uh, interesting connection between artificial and, and natural systems. And reinforcement learning, in fact, has sort of developed at the intersection of research in neuroscience and research in the computational field. I myself am a computer scientist, so I really sit very firmly on the computational side of things. Um, but I tried in this talk to uh, kind of bring existing results from neuroscience in order to show the connections between the different uh, sets of ideas. So reinforcement learning in, in natural systems is about learning how to behave uh, from a reward structure. So you have on the picture there a little mouse that's trying to uh, get food pellets by pressing a sequence of levers. And there's been a long history uh, in psychology and in neuroscience of training animals to achieve all kinds of complicated tasks. We train uh, reinforcement learning computational agents in the same way by allowing them to interact with an environment. So the agent is perceiving the state of the environment. It's allowed to choose actions. And as a result, it receives numerical rewards, which may be quite delayed from the time when the actions that warrant the reward actually happened. And the really tricky part is actually doing this kind of temporal association between a very delayed numerical reward and the states and actions that have actually caused it, that's sometimes called the temporal credit assignment problem. Um, so in terms of how we, we model the problem, we think of the agent as perceiving the state of the environment. Based on this perception, it's allowed to choose actions. The rewards come in. And the goal of the agent in life is to learn how to choose actions. We call that a policy. That's typically a probabilistic uh, quantity that maps states into a probability distribution over actions. And the goal of this policy is to maximize not the immediate reward, but actually some measure of long-term return. And uh, this is really the, the crux of the algorithms that have gone uh, into uh, AlphaGo and AlphaZero, these, uh, these tremendous successes that, that were mentioned earlier today. And this is just a little cartoon sort of illustrating what is going on inside uh, AlphaZero. So what, what we have here is an artificial neural network. It's a convolutional neural network that is looking at the board. The board is encoded in terms of whether at each intersection there's a white, a black piece, or nothing. And so the perceptions or the states are the possible states of the board that are encountered during the games. The actions are legal moves. And the reward only happens at the end of the game. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the reward is either a plus one or minus one if you win or you lose the game. And that's the only information that the agent gets. And the agent is never told exactly what it should have done at a particular board position nor does it receive any kind of heuristic information based on, let's say, configuration of pieces or any kind of prior knowledge that people might have. <clears throat> and it just trains by playing games against itself. And based on this training experience, which granted is very large, it consists of millions and millions of games, the agent can learn not only to behave very well, but also to invent new ways of playing. And that's really quite remarkable. And in some sense, the fact that this is learned from experience rather than from being told is perhaps the reason why the agents are able uh, to, uh, to invent, because they're not biased by our prejudices. So this could be very scary, or it could be very exciting, depending on sort of where you sit in the debate about whether AI is good or bad. Now, what are the basic principles of reinforcement learning? All of machine learning really is driven by minimizing prediction errors of some sort. And so reinforcement learning is not about how the model is constructed. It's really about what kind of errors are you trying to minimize and what is the mechanism by which we're going to do that. And so in reinforcement learning, what we're looking at is uh, predictions about the expected future cumulative reward. And the agents are going to try to make these predictions consistent over time. Okay? In other words, agents don't like to be surprised. If they're surprised, that's going to generate an error signal. And the agent's going to try to adjust its predictions so that that error goes away. And we're going to look at this in, in uh, more detail in a minute. 
The other basic principle is that we want to associate the actions with the outcomes. And so if an action leads to a situation that is better than expected, that action will become more likely. And to the contrary, if the action leads to a situation that's worse than the agent expected, the probability of that action is going to be decreased. And of course, this is going to require lots and lots of experience where these actions appear in different contexts so that we can learn correctly the associations between the states or the stimuli and these actions. So now we're going to look a little bit at a sort of very crucial object that reinforcement learning agents uh, keep, which is sort of the basic form of knowledge representation. It's a value function. And the value function really is a measure of the future reward that the agent will get. So here, by pi, we denote a policy. Policy is the way that the agent chooses actions, the mapping from states to actions. And the value function tells us what's the expected future reward. But there's one little tweak. We typically use a discount factor, which is a number between 0 and 1, in order to mark the fact that we would prefer to get rewards sooner rather than later. And so rewards that are received farther into the future are actually discounted. Um, there's a different way of thinking of the discount factor, which actually is quite interesting from the point of view of future things I will tell you about. Uh, it's helpful to think of this as the probability of the agent continuing this trajectory versus stopping. So on every, at every point in time, the agent might die, in which case there's no more rewards. Rewards from then on are zero. Or if it continues, then the reward stream is going to continue as well. And so a lot of reinforcement learning algorithms have the goal of estimating these kinds of value functions and then using these value functions in order to shape the behavior or to shape the policy to move the action probabilities in a good direction. And perhaps the most famous uh, learning algorithm that also has the strongest connections to neuroscience is temporal difference learning, uh, which was uh, established by Sadden and Bartow. Um, and so I will take you through this algorithm because if you remember one thing from my talk, I think this would be a good one to remember. Um, so in temporal difference learning, as I, as I mentioned before, we want to make sure that the predictions of the agent are somewhat consistent over time. So the agent is going to maintain um, an estimate of its uh, value function. And uh, this estimate we call V of ST. Okay, that's the, the value that I estimate for, for the future, starting from state ST onwards. So the agent does something, and then time ticks. Now the agent finds itself in a new situation. In this new situation, it's received a little bit of new information. It's received one new reward, and it observes the value of one new state, ST plus 1. And so now the agent knows something for sure, the reward that it's received. And it can guess from here on what will happen. This is via ST plus 1. It's the agent's guess. It's not perfect because it's only based on information that the agent has seen so far. But over time, this guess will become better and better. So we're going to take a leap of faith and use that as a, as a true estimate of what will happen. And so we're going to look at the difference between these two pieces of information. What did I estimate at time step t? And what's my new estimate at time step t plus 1? That is the temporal difference error. And that's the error signal that's going to drive the agents. And the interesting thing about this, of course, is that we don't need any supervision to compute this. The reward stream is coming in from the world. And V is an estimate that the agent maintains internally. And so this means that reinforcement learning systems can actually learn from experience without always having, let's say, correct labels that are coming from an expert. Now, if the value function is actually parameterized, we can now adjust the parameter vector in order to minimize this error signal. And so what you have here is a very simple uh, gradient-based learning rule, standard learning rule, uh, to move uh, the weights uh, in the direction that uh, minimizes this error. Interestingly, Schultz, Diane, and Montague uh, showed that these TDRs actually model very accurately the activity of dopamine neurons in the brain. And there was a whole ton of follow-up literature in neuroscience that studied um, sort of the, the, uh, this model and tried to break it, in fact. And it turns out to be a, quite a resilient model of, of uh, dopamine neuron activity. Now, what do we do if we have a value function? Well, what we would like is to then adjust the agent's behavior. And one of the standard ways to do that is what's called the actor-critic architecture, again due to Sutton and Bartow. 
So in the act of critical architecture, the value function is basically criticizing the policy, and the policy is the one that's taking actions. And so rather than just trying to learn the expected returns, what we try to do is move the policy parameters in the direction that is going to improve these returns. And so we use TD errors to drive the value function, and then we use the value function to modify the policy. And the sort of critical quantity in this is what people sometimes call the advantage. The advantage means, is an action better than average or not? If an action is better than average, we should take it more often. And so this advantage quantity is actually quite instrumental in moving the policy towards, towards good actions. Now, Odoherty and colleagues have shown some fMRI evidence that actually the dorsolateral striatum implements the actor and the vector, ventral striatum implements somehow a critic. And these, I think, are not as solid results as, as the TD learning results, uh, but it's a, it's a theory that has been put forward as sort of mapping this particular uh, way of, of uh, computing um, onto brain structures. <clears throat> now, all that I've told you so far is quite interesting. Uh, but it doesn't take us all the way to real artificial intelligence. And what I mean by this is that we would like agents that learn quickly, that learn about the hierarchical structure of the world, that learn about objects and their properties, and that learn to predict and act at multiple timescales. And so, because, of course, reinforcement learning is a very nice computational framework, uh, and because it's got these sort of strong connections to neuroscience, we would actually like to leverage reinforcement learning ideas, uh, but to put them in the context of learning for AI. So learning higher level representations at longer timescales about objects, about causality, about things that we think are fundamental to the way that people act. And so uh, I'm going to specifically focus on thinking about what's the right timescale at which to do actions and predictions, and can an agent actually learn that timescale at which it should be taking actions and making predictions about the world. And we would like to do this as much as possible with semantics that the agent infers from its own interaction rather than things that are pre-programmed from outside. And so we're going to avoid people putting in very much knowledge. We're going to try and have the agents, as much as possible, learn this knowledge from interaction with the world. So as a mom of three kids, my dream is a, a dinner cooking robot, also a house cleaning robot and a laundry folding robot and all these kinds of things. We're very far from that. Um, and you know, one question is why. And you know, on one hand, it's, of course, because hardware limitations of robotics. Uh, make it hard to just do the manual tasks. But on the other hand, there's some conceptual limitations. And so even if you think of something as, as simple as cooking dinner, um, there's all kinds of levels of reasoning that, that need to be integrated. Uh, there are some high-level decisions, like which recipe do you want to, uh, to cook tonight? And then there's some middle-level decisions. If you pick the recipe, now there's some executing, picking bowls and putting pots on on the stove and so on. And then there's muscle contractions, right? You have to stir, you have to chop, and so on. You probably don't even think of the muscle contractions, okay? But if you have young kids, you notice that that's actually quite a big problem, okay? They, they can do things very, very wrong and, and that um, you need to, to watch over them all the time. But people have all of these levels of decision making and they're all seamlessly integrated. And we would like to have the same property in artificial agents. So one of the things that I've worked on for uh, quite a few years now is a way to uh, embed this idea in the reinforcement learning agents that we want to have an ability to shape the action space in order to have actions that take variable amounts of time. Okay? And so I'm going to call such actions options. Okay? Options because they're choices that the agent can make. And uh, options very closely mimic the ideas of, let's say, controllers from robotics, um, or macro actions from classical AI, the idea is that the agent has a set of preconditions where an option could be initiated. If the option initiates, it's going to take control and it's going to execute for some while. That means it has an internal policy. And then uh, it's going to reach uh, an end or a termination function. Um, and when the end is reached, then the agent is free to choose something else to do. 
And uh, because we want to do this in reinforcement learning, we're still going to do it this in sequential fashion. So the agent may choose an option, and that option is going to take control. When it terminates, the agent has a choice again. But once the option starts executing, it's really the option that has control. And so this matches very nicely with, let's say, uh, programming with subroutines or with functions in, in sort of call and return fashion. And of course, in, in robotics, people do this naturally all the time. They write controllers. Things like, for example, a navigation task, a robot can move forward if there's nothing in front of it, and it will keep moving forward according to a pre-specified policy until there's something that's too close. Okay, so this is sort of closed loop controllers that we might put in. What we would like is to have a way to learn such controllers automatically from interaction with an environment by leveraging the same type of methodology that reinforcement learning agents have. And so the sort of cartoon is that unlike in usual reinforcement learning where you have discrete time ticks and at every time tick the agent is allowed to choose a primitive action, we're actually going to have uh, sort of states at which there's a decision. These are sort of the open circles over there. When a decision is made, an option initiates and it will go on for some period of time until it terminates and then a new decision can be made. Um, and again, this relates somewhat to hybrid control, for example. Now, Interestingly, if we're working already with the reinforcement learning problem, we kind of have an overlap between the low-level timescale at which the world ticks and this high-level timescale at which we want to make decisions. And a lot of the work that, that I've done was trying to make sure that these two stay in sync and that we can in fact leverage the fact that there is this underlying temporal structure and that really, if we look at any given option, it's like a mini sub-problem, a mini reinforcement learning problem that we could solve in the same way that we solve the large problem. So the learning algorithms, the planning algorithms are not really different at these different levels of temporal abstraction. They're all, all going to be the same. Um, are there any neural correlates of options? Um, I'm not sure, but my colleague Matt, who's going to talk this afternoon, has done some really interesting work trying to find uh, such neural correlates. So this picture here is talking uh, on that side about sort of computational models, specifically the actor-critic architecture, and an actor-critic but which uses options, okay? And on this other side is sort of uh, existing known or postulated neural correlates that might exist in the brain. So in actor-critic, like we discussed, there's a policy, and that policy is being modified through a value function. Um, in options, what happens is the policy now has more structure. The policy says we want to choose a high-level behavior, and that high-level behavior, once it's chosen, is going to drive the low-level behavior. Um, and so that means that it, from the point of view of how things are implemented, actually, probably we need more structure uh, to, to implement these two things. Uh, so if the dorsolateral striatum is the usual actor, then in the prefrontal cortex we have this extra little bit that does the higher level selection of what's the high level course of action, what's the option that we want to choose. And then once that's chosen, um, the choice goes back to the actor. Um, also because now we have these two different choices, the high level choice and the low level choice, the value estimates need to be able to work at both of these levels. And so the value function requires a little bit more information as well. And so uh, that's in the orbital frontal cortex, perhaps. And again, I'm not a neuroscientist, so I will defer all questions about where this is coming from to Matt. He's going to love me for that. Now, options, as I described them so far, are used to generate behavior. They're used to drive a policy. Um, but really what we would like is to have uh, models that can be used for the agent to imagine possible futures and to support different ways of decision making. And so um, models in reinforcement learning consist of immediate rewards and predictions about where the agent may end up next. Okay? Models of options are going to similarly consist of rewards and predictions about where we may end up. But the reward now is perhaps received over multiple time steps because an option executes over multiple time steps. And the prediction of where we end up is again about the end of the option, okay, which may happen after some amount of time. So really we don't just want to know where we end up, but actually also after how long. Okay? Um, 
So what do these models look like? They're expectation models, okay? Um, and there's a formula there uh, that I've put up, which is the reward op for the option model. The details are not important, okay? There's two things that I want you to notice. First of all, is that this actually still, because this is a reward model, it still links back to the reward of the world, okay? That allows sort of this uh, matching of what the option knows and what the world actually does. So the agent can't really fantasize things that are very far removed from reality. The other little interesting bit is that this looks very much like a value function, but the discounting has changed, okay? So how does a trajectory of an option uh, end? It either ends because the world ends, okay? That's the discount factor gamma, or it ends because the agent decides to end, okay? And so um, this, the sort of discounting basically reflects both of these sources of termination, okay? Either on its agent's own will or based on the world. So this model is really a value function, okay? It's a value function with a discount that's a bit fancier. It's what's called a state-dependent discount. Uh, but because it's a value function, we can use temporal difference learning in order to learn these models, okay? Um, and that's nice because we already know temporal difference learning. We know that it's a reliable uh, algorithm and we can just reuse it in this context. Now, why are we interested in models? Well, really because it, they help in planning. And so I just wanted to show you a little illustration of how models help in planning. So this is a cartoon uh, task called the rooms environment. It's a grid world navigation task where the agent has to find a goal. The goal is marked with a green dot. Um, and it has no information until it actually reaches the goal. So if you start an agent and it doesn't know anything, it will wander at random for some while, possibly a long while, until it hits the goal for the first time. Now, if the agent had a model of the world, if it could imagine itself in different states and understand where it can reach from those states, then of course, uh, one could uh, plan to reach the goal. And the way you would do it in this case is sort of backwards planning. So you'd start at the goal, you'd say, oh, where can I reach the goal from? Okay, and then from those states, you know what to do. So you just need to know how to reach those states. And sort of the information propagates away from the goal. And so in the top row, you see this information propagating in the case where we're using primitive action models. These are one-step models, and so in one step, we can understand where we can reach the goal from, but you can see that this information diffuses very slowly. If you have a very big environment and the rewards are sparse, they're only in a few places, there's only a few goal states, um, then it's going to take many steps for the agent to understand how to reach that goal from wherever it is. Now, what do option models do? Well, option models make predictions from anywhere that an option can start, and they predict where the option will end and in how many steps. So in some sense, they're much more powerful because they're, they have a temporal extent. They have more foresight. And so in the bottom row, you see the information propagating backwards from the goal, but it propagates one room at a time. The agent knows how to reach the goal from the entire room. Perhaps this knowledge has been trained ahead of time. And so in just two planning steps, it can actually figure out uh, how to navigate from anywhere in the environment to the goal. So this is the power of models, and these temporally extended models really provide a big benefit compared to single step models in terms of diffusing the information uh, faster, especially in these situations where you have sparse rewards. Now, one question is, um, are these models enough? And what other kinds of things could we imagine the agent knowing? Okay. And again, because we are in the context of reinforcement learning, and because value functions are a very powerful uh, sort of tool, um, one question that comes up is, can we sort of make the value function the central piece of knowledge that the agent maintains, not just about rewards, but about the world in general? In other words, are value functions really a form of model. Um, and so here, we're going to uh, think a little bit about this in the context of, of uh, fixed policy. So the agent has a fixed policy, but it may try to predict expectations of cumulative quantities over time. Uh, so these cumulants can depend on state or state action pairs or state action next state pairs. Um, and we're going to use a generalization of discounting, which is, again, state-dependent discounting. And this is actually um, 
kind of easy to see if you think about the reward model. In the reward model, we have state dependent discounted already because the discounts depend on the probabilities of options terminating, which are dependent on state. Um, so this can just be made more general, can be an arbitrary function that maps states into 0, 1. And then the cumulants, uh, of course, don't need to be scalar. They could be part of some vector space. And so with this, we obtain uh, actually quite a rich set of things that we could compute, which are all expectation models, and they're all value function-like. And as a result, can all be learned through temporal difference learning. And that's really the goal and the beauty of it is to try and leverage as much as we can this temporal difference learning mechanism uh, in all parts of, of our architecture. Now, what's an example of something like this? Well, one example is the successor representation. Successor representation one is introduced by Diane, and it's really uh, sort of uh, come back uh, into fashion. Um, and it's a way of representing states, not based on the features that are observed locally in the state, but based on where they can reach. Okay? And so specifically, uh, in Diane's work, he looked at representing states by the discounted occupancy of other states that will follow them. This is, of course, all conditioned on some policy. And so it turns out that successor representations can be thought of as vector-valued generalized value functions where the cumulant is simply the features. And so they fit very nicely into this. They showcase the fact that we can have cumulants that are not scalars. Um, and then, of course, in the case of successor representations, there's some really nice sort of properties. I'm not going to really have uh, time to, to discuss that in detail, but which allow us to uh, use them to compute value functions single shot for many different reward functions. There's actually a very nice uh, paper by Sam Gershman uh, just of this year uh, that, in fact, uh, points to dopamine perhaps giving vector-valued signals for updating such representations in the brain. Um, and so I will just want to show you, though, what do these things look like. So again, this is uh, taken from uh, one of Matt's papers. Um, sort of the, the, the picture with the dots is showing the successor representation computed for the states in the room's environment. Okay, so that is the discounted occupancy that we have for these states um, under, uh, under a random behavior policy. And what you see is that the rooms are very much apparent. They're in four clusters. But also the hallway states are very much apparent. They're sort of on, a, on their own. And in this type of environment, actually, the hallway states are very interesting because they're the states that allow you to travel around the environment from one part of the environment to the next. And in some sense, they are the natural structure for imposing sub-goals that the agent should know about. If the agent knows how to go to these uh, sub-goal states, these hallway states, it will very quickly learn how to orient itself through the entire environment. So we're going to sort of piggyback on this idea a little bit later. The other uh, sort of interesting uh, point in this um, is that models are really important, and having models provides additional benefits from just having temporally extended behavior. And so in this environment, um, the, the experiment is that we have this navigation task. The agent has to go from the green state to the red state, okay? And it could use just primitive actions, um, and it could figure out how, how to do this, or it could use options, but it could still model just the primitive actions or it could actually model the options. And so the bottom, the bottom curve, the one labeled hierarchical saltatory, that's really these jumpy models, models of options, that imagine getting all the way to the end of the option as opposed to unrolling things one time step at a time. And that provides a big speed benefit in terms of how the agent can circulate uh, in this environment. So it's important to have models. They're a nice way of encapsulating knowledge, perhaps from prior learning tasks or subtasks that the agent may have learned. Um, but at the same time, uh, we can learn these models, in fact, through the same methods that we learn usual value functions in, in flat traditional reinforcement learning. So what's the frontier? The frontier really is option discovery, right? Where do these temporal abstractions actually come from? Um, and, uh, of course, if we knew how to solve this, then we could have agents that discover the world and make sub goals for themselves and, and uh, everything would be wonderful. Um, a lot of the work that's been done in a practical setting has been, in fact, to program these abstractions in, in some form. 
perhaps we can program the controller and then learn models that match that controller. For example, this is a very standard approach that's used in robotics. Um, in, prior, in prior work, what we did was actually to impose secondary reward structures that kind of drive the learning of the options. So for example, if uh, as a designer of the system, I think that sub goals uh, like hallways are important, I can reward the agent for achieving these sub goals. And you can imagine even in the context of a video game, for example, that you might give intermediate rewards to the agent for achieving certain things, getting a certain type of object uh, and stuff like that. And there are some interesting uh, links of, of this approach to, let's say, intrinsic motivation um, in, in sort of uh, biological systems. So if we have a secondary reward structure, of course, we can use usual reinforcement learning to learn an option policy along with its model so that the option optimizes the structure. And so this is a, a sort of a picture of an option that's been learned uh, in this room's environment in order to get to a target hallway. Um, this again, uh, some nice work from uh, Jose Ribas Fernandez and colleagues, which shows uh, neural correlates of these sub goals ideas uh, in the brain. And so here, the, this is a task uh, that was done with people. Um, and in this case, there's a little um, sort of delivery task where the person has to take a truck, take it to pick up a package, and then deliver this package somewhere. And the question was, is this just going to be sort of standard reinforcement learning what people do, or do people actually make a sub-goal of going and picking up the package? Is that somehow uh, sort of encoded differently? And there seems to be some evidence okay, that in fact people do learn these sub-goals of intermediate tasks that need to be solved before the whole task is solved, even though this is not externally rewarded. Okay, so this must be something that, that people generate on their own. Now, what kind of sub-goals are interesting? A lot of the work in the field has focused on this idea of bottleneck states. And perhaps this is a side effect of the room's environment, I'm not really sure. Uh, but it has this very strong spatial intuition that these states that allow you to circulate in the environment are somehow important. Um, and so bottleneck states are these states that connect different parts of the environment. And there's been quite a bit of uh, literature on computational ways of identifying such states, perhaps by uh, looking at the structure of the graph of states, the map, clustering, and so on. Um, it's very computationally intensive to do that. Uh, bottleneck states, however, do seem to be important for people. And again, there was some really nice work by Alex Solway um, and Matt and, and colleagues uh, these are people experiments where people were uh, doing delivery tasks over a map in a town. Um, and they showed that uh, these bottleneck states actually uh, appear to be selected as important by people. They are indicated as states that are going to be visited on, on paths when people are queried. And the experiments really indicate that people build this hierarchical map organization where they want to navigate to these bottleneck states and then from there. Um, go somewhere else, and there's, uh, there's some uh, information theoretic accounts of, of uh, th these ideas basically through uh, compression, right? People like plans that are short. The estates actually allow us to make short plans. Um, and so in that sense, they are, they are interesting. Now, for a computational agent, however, it turns out that what the sub goals are may not be that important, okay? So this is work that we've done that's purely computational where we just generated random sub-goals in an environment, and then we looked at, at how people can cope with this. And what you can see is that random sub-goals actually help an agent a lot. These two agents have the same amount of experience, but one is using just primitive actions, the other one is navigating from sub-goal to sub-goal. And the one that uses the sub-goals has a much easier time sort of finding its path. So, all of this work has been focused on finding sub-goals through some secondary reward structure. Uh, one of the things that we've tried to do more recently is uh, really to state explicitly an optimization criterion and actually solve it in automated fashion so that we don't need to maintain any form of map or uh, provide any other form of prior knowledge. And the approach that we've come up with is called Option Critic. This is actually work that has been carried out by Pierre-Luc Bacon. Uh, in his PhD thesis, and he's now a postdoc at Stanford uh, with Emma Brunskill, so if you want to ask him about this, you can also do that. Um, 
And the idea of option critic is really to extend what, what we have in actor critic, but to the setting of options. And so in the case of options, we have structure in the policy and structure in the value function, uh, but we can easily uh, sort of put this in the perspective of an actor critic algorithm. You have a little bit more uh, sort of detail that you need to keep track of computationally, but we can make a, a gradient based algorithm that simply optimizes returns uh, in this architecture. And so I'll just show you quickly some results of what this does. Uh, this is a task in which we are looking whether uh, the learned options um, actually uh, can transfer from one environment to the next. So in this case, we had a navigation task. We had agents learn how to go around the room's environment. And at some point, the goal moves randomly. And of course, all agents are now lost. They go to the former goal. The goal is no longer there. And we're looking at for how quickly they can recover. And the top two curves there, the slower curves are primitive actions. The bottom curves are option critic. Uh, and these agents can recover the goal much faster. And it turns out that the learned options are also quite intuitive. So if we look at where these options terminate, they actually end up terminating around the hallway states, even though they were never told specifically that there's an extra reward or somehow the hallways are important. Uh, we also tried to do this in the context of uh, deep learning. So deep reinforcement learning using a convolutional neural network, looking at the Atari game platform. Um, and the gradient-based update rules actually la land up with uh, very uh, interesting and intuitive ways of adapting uh, what the agent does. The internal policies basically of all the options go to taking better primitive actions. And the options learn to terminate whenever there's somebody better than them that can take control. And so uh, results were very encouraging. In the, these are results in Atari games where uh, comparing against DQN, which is a state-of-art um, algorithm. And what you see is that even if you have one task, the agent that uses options can actually solve this task faster or almost as fast. Now, you might think, OK, this is uh, not that impressive. But for somebody like me who's been trying to get a result like this within a single task for a long time, this is actually really good news. Because of course, what we would expect is that now, if we take these options and we transfer them among, for example, different similar games, we would see much larger gains. Um, the other interesting thing is that, again, the options are quite intuitive. So for example, this is a, a task in which you have a submarine, and we learn options that take the submarine up for air and then take the submarine down to rescue a person. So you can really chunk the experience into, into these chunks that people would probably also find uh, useful to think about. Um, the only other um, problem is that over time, of course, the options will go away. And that's because we know from theory that primitive actions are always sufficient for optimal behavior. And this in substance is also mirrored from findings in neuroscience where sort of uh, models are not used until the end. At some point, habitual learning takes over. So primitive actions are sort of like habitual learning. So in order to preserve the options, because we think that they are very useful, we use ideas from bounded rationality, specifically reasoning about uh, the action choices is expensive. Okay? Um, and so we're going to penalize thinking too much. We're going to penalize the agent every time he makes a choice about, about the options, because those are planning steps. And uh, this actually results in quite interesting effects. So this is, again, one of the Atari games. And uh, you see the effect of uh, deliberation cost is basically that the agent chunks up larger portions of the environment where it wants to execute the same option. Let's say going all the way down a corridor until an intersection. And the terminations, again, end up being quite intuitive. The terminations end up being either at places where the agent has to change direction or whenever the agent is in the presence of an adversary, because then it has to sort of switch direction and kind of run away. So just to conclude, I think there is really a very interesting bridge in reinforcement learning between the computational side and the neuroscience and cognitive science side of things. <clears throat> and I would hope that this will continue and, in fact, strengthen with hierarchical reinforcement learning. Um, <clears throat> there are many open problems in hierarchical reinforcement learning on the computational side. The issue of option discovery, we have some answers, perhaps better answers than a couple years ago. But still, this, this idea is uh, quite in its infancy. Where do these options come from? And what is our motivation for, for keeping them around? Um, we are also thinking about generalized value functions as a, as a general way of representing knowledge. 
and a powerful computational tool. And we would like to understand whether this is really present uh, in the brain as well, and if so, how and where. Um, and just in general, one of the interesting open problems is this, uh, this problem of continual learning. Uh, people uh, learn over time. They get better skills. They build on top of existing knowledge. Whereas automated agents still have a hard time doing that unless we sort of bias them very strongly to do that. That does not arise naturally. In fact, there is uh, many examples of catastrophic forgetting, where if an agent has to learn something new, it'll first dismantle its prior knowledge. So that's an open issue where I think we could, in fact, get a lot of inspiration from neuroscience. Thank you.